I leave you in their capable hands. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Gosh, well, look, I don't know about you, because I'm quite nervous. This is kind of like, you know, a, a live gig. And, you know, uh, having been around the block more years than I, I care to reflect on, this is this, it's quite interesting. And I suspect for many of you, this might be the first physical event at scale you've attended. So we're, we're all here a quiver uh, of, of just, what well, kind of re remembering the format of a definitely. live conversation. Yeah. Definitely. I have not done one of these for a while. I think the last, <laughs> the last one I was at was in... Uh, was in March 2020, yeah, yeah, and yeah. how much the world has changed since then. So let's just reflect on that for a moment. Um, yeah, so much has changed in the context of the pandemic. And of course, one interesting uh, feature is how data has been um, thrust to the center of the debate, or, or reaction to it, how we deal with it. In fact, of course, data.gov.uk is the kind of site where you get all the information about everything from vaccine rates to, uh, to infection rates and tests and positive tests throughout the country. So no doubt that people are really aware. I mean, we're all aware that we live in this data-driven world, but what do you think the kind of uh, uh, impact of the data has been within, I mean, you're now you're a creature of government, but within that context, where do you see the impact? Oh, wow. I mean, I think the impact of data and data-driven technologies during the, uh, during the pandemic was was really profound and actually if I can if I can sort of reverse back to to March 2020 and, and where I was in my last role I think I felt very lucky because I was working with businesses who were uh, trying to respond to the pandemic very quickly uh, trying to uh, trying to innovate um, and data-driven technology really underpinned uh, a lot of that um, and of course the most visible uh, technology update for all of us was uh, the switch onto Zoom calls um, but for many businesses, it was the moment where they suddenly uh, initiated data strategies that they might have had sort of looking five years into the future and they were implementing them in a, in a couple of months. Um, so we saw more and more businesses moving onto the cloud and adopting things like HR software um, and often uh, stepping up to work with the government as well. So we saw uh, companies providing um, AI software to help with um, onboarding in the NHS, to, so to speed up HR systems. Um, and I mean, all, all sorts of really brilliant examples. Actually, one of my favorite and one that I always give a bit of a pitch for uh, is the Vodafone Foundation uh, set up their uh, Dream Lab so people can use uh, the, the computing capacity in their phone while they're sleeping yeah. mm. uh, to solve tricky problems. And they, and they sort of provided that capacity to help with, uh, with COVID research. So, you know, I saw this massive step up from the business community um, in terms of how data was being used. And we saw it in the government's response mm. um, as well. Certainly the, the CDEI team was mm. very involved with the uh, the development of the um, NHS uh, COVID app. Uh, and while I'm sure many of us didn't enjoy getting pinged, I got pinged twice and I definitely did not enjoy that. Um, it's thought to have uh, prevented something like 600,000 yeah. uh, infections. So I think that the role that data has played and been able to play in sort of um, responding to the COVID crisis has been genuinely, uh, genuinely quite profound. I mean, new challenges, I think, mm. have, have uh, appeared because of that, particularly, um, you know, coming, coming from looking at this from a private sector perspective, uh, companies that have adopted technology really quickly might not have thought about what the governance implications of that are. Um, and I suspect we'll see that more widely as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, well, the ODI was in a very similar situation. We were suddenly uh, rendered uh, work from home, adopting the technology, and we're a pretty I think IT literate organization, but it was surprising just how uh, fundamental that change was. I remember some of the early work we were doing was around uh, just working with organizations who wanted to publish their data out. Because I think the striking thing about the pandemic was so many people wanted to help. Yeah. They wanted to bring their expertise, their data to bear, but how did they do it? And, and, and what was the most effective way? And of course, in, in government, you had a situation where there were so many offers of help that how did they triage that? And, and, and I think that was a, a, an interesting exercise. So how to publish data, um, how to license it, how to make it fit for purpose. That's definitely been a forcing function. I think I've also noticed in working with colleagues who in Oxford who have been involved you know, right on the front line of some of this in, in terms of how data is used to inform evidence-based based policy. We couldn't have had a more dramatic example. Um, and, and good things and bad things have come out of that. I, I was reflecting on the fact that um, uh, for a long time we had 
an understandable worry about our patient data being linked yeah. at scale and, and, and patterns uh, extracted from that. Ben Goldacre and his team using OpenSafely uh, devised this really interesting methodology where the data sits behind the firewalls yeah. and you build your models on synthetic data of the questions you want to ask. And then the models are put to the data without the data ever leaving the firewalls. And so these models have allowed us to understand comorbidities, susceptibility, new potential therapies. And that kind of speed of change has, has really been very visible, I think, a whole, whole range, as you were saying. But I mean, where, where do you, whilst that's all been to the good, yeah. where do you think um, challenges or, or, or not so smart uses of data might have cropped up? So I think the question around challenges is is a really important uh, is a really important one, and so CDI has been doing quite a lot of work into into public attitudes and what informs uh, how people feel about data and how data is going to be used. And actually, your example is a is a really good one because um, you've got two of the key factors in there which really matter uh, to the general public. Um, so the first is just understanding what the benefit of the of the data use is going to be, and I think. Um, unsurprisingly, actually, people are much more uh, willing to share their data and much more likely to be happy about data use uh, if they can see a really tangible benefit um, from the use. And that might be for themselves or it might be for, for society. But actually, the scenario matters. So being able to say specifically what the data will be used for and what you're hoping to get out of, of them sharing their information yeah. with you. Um, so, for example, you could say, well, this is going to help us with uh, early detection of breast cancer and it will save so many lives um, versus just saying, oh, well, we want to share the data for, for general health purposes. Um, the scenario versus the abstract makes quite a big, uh, quite a big difference. Mm. Um, and then the second point around having the trusted governance mechanisms in place. So our uh, research shows that that is the single biggest factor yeah. as to whether people will be uh, will be happy with their data being shared and, and the technologies being used as well. But I think there are a couple of other uh, things that we say, see as being important. Uh, so the actor can make quite a big difference. Um, in general, uh, the public are happier with the public sector uh, having and sharing their data, though there's quite mm. a lot of uh, variation there. So there's high trust with the NHS uh, and some public institutions, for example, the police, there's quite big demographic differences yeah. between yeah. whether people trust them or not, which is hugely important when you're looking at uh, sort of security, uh, security data. Um, so I think that, that that matters a lot. Sort of who, who is it that's, uh, that's using my data? Um, so we'll probably come on to that because yeah. I'm interested to sort of uh, explore with you what we think is going to happen in this um, uh, difference between public and, and private sector. But just staying with the with with the lessons from the pandem pandemic, one thing that the ODI was 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 interested in, I would say surprised to find, but it came through very clearly was yes, the willingness of uh, the public to have data shared under condition of understanding what the purpose was and what the context of use was. But even when you talk to scientists, interestingly enough, we've, we found that, that, that even in the scientific community, there were barriers mm. to, um, to sharing data. And, and they, some of these were just entirely understandable. I mean, the modelers in particular were so seized with the urgent questions that were being put to them on a daily basis that the idea of being able to use other kinds of data to inform their judgments or to have a real sense of being able to worry about the provenance and quality of the data yeah. that were being given, this, this was a real challenge to them. So it, it struck us that in a scientific setting where the fair principles, you know, findable, accessible, um, uh, interoperable, retrievable, were all or reusable, were all yeah. meant to be in place. There's, there's still challenges. Even in the most literate context, there are still challenges to face. Absolutely. And, and in a way, I'm, I'm very unsurprised by this. I was, I was thinking about this particular question um, and reflecting that Probably about uh, 10 years ago, in the job before the last one, when I used to work for the manufacturer's organization, um, I remember one of my members who was in the aerospace sector uh, talking to me and saying that they really wanted to be able to, uh, to share data about their business uh, with, um, with their suppliers and with their customers, but they were hugely nervous about, um, about losing their IP um, and so didn't know how to hold on to it and, and didn't know how to, 
um, how to manage that risk. And, and they put a lot of money and time into, um, into that IP. And it wasn't all about data. Some of it was about their business uh, know-how. So it was a slightly wider question. But I was really struck by how this was holding up uh, innovation across the supply chain and product development. Um, and actually, you know, you've, you've already sort of touched on the role that data intermediaries can play here. And we see um, slightly slightly different industry, but looking at the airline sector, the APRICON initiative there is specifically yeah. enabling people to share uh, share data throughout their supply chain and facilitate product development. So I think you're, you're very right that finding the model for sharing data is not straightforward. It's not easy, but it does make a difference when you can do so it. So this is where the kind of complementary facets of CDEI, ODI come into play, because I mean, we're there trying to um, um, in a certain sense, work with private and, and, and public organizations. You're also trying to get government to understand how it can also make better use of the data it has. And, and some of these issues come up consistently. So um, you know, there's always this worry, are people incentivized to share it? Are they able to share it? Is, is the basic standards for publishing and interoperability and securing the data uh, sufficiently established? Are the foundations there? And we'll, and we'll come on to the NDS, the National Data Strategy in a moment about this, this whole issue about whether the foundations are there. But all of that aside, there are still really significant challenges on sometimes finding and sometimes improving. I mean, so the striking thing for me in, uh, in COVID, and I know for many colleagues in the ODI, was this, 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 this dependency that we had yeah. on critical data sets, um, which had to be rapidly and radically enhanced. So we had the ONS, for example, Office of National Statistics, stepping in and commissioning these very large scale surveys and studies, because we, we simply didn't have reliable data, um, whatever appeared in the models, about uh, what effective transmission rates were. Or, or, and, and it turned out, interestingly, that some of the most reliable data was, of course, objective data that you could establish, like who had been hospitalized. But yeah. for much of the rest of it, these were guesstimates. And, they were, and, and, and I think what we've seen is this awareness that we have to work really hard to, um, to improve our data assets. And, some of those data assets will come not just from um, where you, you know, the public sector. So fa famously, mobile data yeah. from the teleco, uh, uh, our use of um, our mobile phones gives a huge uh, uh, complex web of social mobility, physical mobility. And that was one of the most essential features that needed to be understood. And yet, despite best efforts and real willingness, it wasn't straightforward to share that happenstance data. Uh, are, are you surprised? Um, I mean, I think I think actually what COVID revealed was just how complex a lot of this uh, data landscape is. And I, you know, coming back to your point about getting the foundations right, you know, I th often we are uh, kind of excited about the possibilities of data, we're excited about the possibilities of AI, and we always want to talk about the frontier and what are the amazing things uh, that data could achieve. And we should talk about those things because we need to think about how we get there. Um, but actually, a lot of the foundations mm. need to need to be put in place. And, you know, I think one thing that that really struck me sort of over over the last five or so years working with uh, working with businesses that you do have a few firms, you have a few organizations who are really at the front. Um, but so many who are who are much sort of further behind and still getting to grips, uh, still getting to grips with this. So we do need to, I think, build that sort of wider foundations, but to really maximise the benefits of, of data more uh, more broadly. And you touched a bit on on sort of data uh, data infrastructure and, and data literacy, and I know that's something that the ODI is doing mm. uh, yeah. doing a lot of work on. Yeah. So so I mean, and, and indeed it features in the the national data strategy. What are the foundations going to look like? Now for us, infrastructure comes in two sorts. It's there's technical infrastructure, yeah. there's the catalogs, the data, the metadata associated with the information you're capturing, uh, how it's deposited, how it's exchanged, how it's licensed. But there are also, of course, um, institutional architectures. And we, we, we talk about the whole idea of data institutions. Are the regulatory and legal constructs that are in place the right ones uh, we need? And I think what's been interesting is, is, is a discussion absolutely around the technical yeah. uh, obstacles to interoperability. And, and some of these are old understood challenges that are still there. The fundamental messy business of data engineering still needs to be done. And I think it's a little bit like the infrastructure in your own house. It's, it's often the kind of you know, makeover that gets uh, uh, featured, you know, the glossy kind of kitchen uh, surfaces, but what's happening underneath in the underlying plumbing is the key. And then back to the issue of institutions. Um, we, we're seeing a conversation around 
public goods and private goods, yeah. and that they don't have to be antagonistic. We see it in conversations around ESG, around impact investing, that, that maybe our private sector isn't just about maximizing shareholder value, it's about putting other things in. Do you think data has a role to play in that context? We certainly do at the OEI. I mean, we're pushing this very In terms hard. of sort of capturing public, yeah. public good. I mean, if, if COVID wasn't an example of that, you know, I don't, I don't know what is. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, just look at uh, private sector companies coming together with uh, government to deliver the NHS COVID-19 data store. And it gave this sort of wealth of, um, wealth of information. Um, but absolutely, and I think that there has been a move from the private sector more generally to look at sort of what's the role of, of business uh, of business purpose, um, but I think that that applies much, much sort of mm. beyond um, the the data landscape. And those data institutions aren't just going to be setting up new formats. They they might be old formats that mm. we can use. I mean, it was interesting to me that one of the places that people tended to go to look were the were essentially the universities, the universities that were doing the fundamental yeah. research. So the the in the US and the UK particular sites that were providing the data on um, efficacy of drug use or whether there were a, a, a side effects associated or that whole tranche of what people felt they could trust. It was interesting that people resorted to institutions which had a legacy of having established some notion of expertise and trustworthiness. I think you're right. And actually, one of the one of the reasons I'm really excited about the opportunity for AI and data in the UK is that we have this really quite phenomenal combination of some great institutions, uh, clearly ODI and uh, CDI in, the, uh, in that mix, um, but also our academic base is absolutely uh, world leading and our business base. And you don't need to look very far in King's Cross to see the sort of wealth of technology, uh, businesses and expertise that we, that we have here. There is a really strong ecosystem in the uh, in the UK, and of course, from a policy perspective, we talked a little bit about the national mm. data strategy, the innovation strategy. We have the AI strategy upcoming um, as well. Um, there is a lot of opportunity, and I think the right people to, to grasp that opportunity. So infrastructure, foundations, key, literacy. So we talk about data literacy a lot. I know that that um, uh, features in um, certainly in the uh, DCMS's uh, uh, brief. Uh, we have programs of training and uh, a whole range of challenges that we try to understand around data literacy here at the ODI. Um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? How far we have to think about potentially um, uh, reformulating the curricula, um, what people's general need and awareness for data literacy are. I mean, again, I suspect the pandemic's been quite a useful forcing function on that and other learner societies, professional bodies are thinking about this, uh, uh, I know. Um, where do you think, just, I mean, this is a root and branch problem, isn't mm. it? Presumably, it's as much a challenge in the C-suite, in the, in the decision-making boardrooms, as it is uh, within the apprenticeships and schoolrooms yeah. and universities that, that we know. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, def definitely thinking back to the, to the old role uh, a bit now, but certainly what we saw through the pandemic was this big increase in uh, in adoption of technology, uh, but alongside that, um, increasing concern that businesses weren't getting the value out of their investment in data that they'd already made. And that's, that is a concern because if they're not getting that value, are they gonna invest in it um, again? And, and I think those conversations do need raising to that uh, strategic level. And we're possibly in that sort of same space that we were with cybersecurity sort of five, 10 years ago, um, where it wasn't always seen as a, as a board level issue. And, and I think data governance, data use, innovation, um, absolutely does need mm. to, to raise up the agenda and making sure that people within the business have the wide range of, of skills for using data. And, and I think beyond um, that being a C-suite issue and beyond that being a, a sort of data uh, sort of coding uh, and software issue, I think just understanding the role that data is going to play in almost everyone's uh, roles at work, but also in our in our personal lives as well. If we really want to capture the benefit of uh, of data, we do need to make sure that everyone is able to engage with it uh, to a certain level. And certainly, that's one of the things that CDI is trying to do through our um, public engagement work um, is to engage people sort of across the UK um, and different demographic groups to try and understand where some of the challenges uh, are and and sort of what what role data governance has in addressing some of that. So the politics of this are such that, I mean, clearly the UK has ambitions to become 
a global mm -hmm. data and digital hub, um, but there's, we, we live in an interdependent international world of data flows. Um, I mean, how, we, how, play, how well placed do we think we are from our respective organizations to fulfill A, the national ambition, and B, what are our international obligations? Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that the UK is already an international leader when it, when it comes to data and data flows. And I, I mean, I think it's a, a fairly old stat, but back in 2015, we, we were the sort of home of something like 11.5% of global international uh, data flows. A lot of that is going through, uh, going through the UK. And I think that the uh, national data strategy sets out uh, more opportunities mm. um, around that. And, and certainly CDEI is, is uh, trying to help with a number of the missions um, within that and, and sort of implementing that. So the mission one uh, around unlocking the value of data somewhere where I'm sure we'll be collaborating with, with ODI as well, um, particularly looking at the role of things like data intermediaries and privacy enhancing technology and how we can help government, uh, government to use those things better um, with the second mission, which is a really important one around uh, developing sort of pro uh, pro trust governance mechanisms, one of the things uh, and pro growth uh, governance mechanisms, one of the things that we're looking at is the role of AI AI assurance, which I'm mm. really excited about because I think there is a uh, big potential for the UK to develop new uh, new industry there and really build on our professional. So we, we've got a definitely shared interest in that because I mean I think one of our thoughts is that if you think of professions of the future. Um, and given the number of professions that now exist that we now even thought about 10 yeah. years or 20 years ago, um, this whole idea of data assurance, new insurance products yeah. and assurance products in the space of data has got to be, it, it, I, I know uh, we're, we're thinking about this very hard in the ODI. So what does it mean to, in some sense, warrant or assure a data asset? What does it mean to warrant or assure the process of doing that audit? And I, I think that is essentially um, equivalent to the development of entire class of insurance yep. product and insurance um, professional that we saw um, in the last uh, uh, in the last century. Uh, so I'm, I'm convinced that will be uh, I know you are uh, that will be a, a growth area. The challenge, of course, is that in this area, particularly of algorithmic driven decision making, mm. I mean data at scale is so so. How do you trust the AI systems? How do you know the data they're fed has not itself been tainted yeah. or biased? I mean, there are some quite deep technical as well as uh, government challenges in all of that, right? There are, uh, but you know, if it was easy, anyone would be doing it. And yeah. I think that I genuinely, I think that that's why this is a very interesting question for the UK to, to be trying to tackle, because as I say, we do have that sort of depth of expertise in professional services. And, and, and if you go, it's very striking if you go into uh, uh, some of the, um, 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 private sector organizations, just the amount of data science that's actually going on within the building is, is pretty impressive, within the organization is pretty impressive. So I think that, that there is real vibrancy around that. And yet it still feels as if that market is to be made, is to be developed. And I think that certainly the ODI, we feel that that working in partnership with both regulators, the public sector, but also the private uh, companies, the organizations who need to build assurance yeah. and trust and validation accreditation around both their people and their processes and the content itself is yeah. going to be a huge area. Huge, huge area and absolutely vital to unlocking all of the benefits from, from data as well. If we know that the general public's sort of likelihood to feel confident in using data is linked no. to feeling like the government's uh, regimes are in place, all sorts of questions about how how do you make these assurance mechanisms visible? How do you bring people along with them? Um, I mean, the, the market is there for, yeah. for developing, but it is, you know, it's a relatively relatively early stage of the conversation right now. And given that um, some of the regulatory machinery that we have thought that might give both insurance and a degree of um, consumer and client uh, citizen protection, GDPR, for example, um, adequacy of that, the Brexit issues, where do you see, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a thought that this gives us an opportunity to be a bit more agile, that we can avoid some of the irritating unintended consequences of things that were well-intentioned, yeah. but, you know, constantly assail you with your browser with consent, consent, consent. You just kind of literally feel mad. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I kind of, I've told you once. Um, How many times yeah. have you accidentally hit accept all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, th th this issue, I know that's going to be on the agenda and there's uh, um, um, uh, uh, responses from government coming out on this, but it's going to be an interesting space where we attempt to be innovative mm -hmm. whilst... Um, um, 
adequate and, and understanding the uh, the notions of, of 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 the international network of of, of of obligations around that. Yeah, I mean, for me, the the two things about innovation and trust just have to go have to go hand in hand. And I think that looking at the national data strategy and the sort of uh, refresh to the uh, CDEI's role that's um, that was consulted on within that, and um, sort of looking at public attitudes, looking at building partnerships. Um, it's all about making sure that those two things are, are happening next to each other, and, and we do need to make sure that that's the case. That we are building a robust, trustworthy um, system. And, and I think for me, the one thing that um, was such a good example of this was just before I left my last job, uh, I was talking to uh, a company who was looking at doing some uh, data sharing with with some others in a different sector. Uh, about um, who their vulnerable customers were, so that the other company yeah. uh, was aware of that, um, and it felt, you know, it felt like really well motivated. They were genuinely trying to do something, uh, something good because they wanted to make sure that those people didn't lose any essential services. But at the same time, they were like, "Well, I have no idea if I should be doing this or not." Mm. Um, and and actually, that's a really important question because that is that is a potential innovation that could make a big difference yeah. to people. It's absolutely right that you are asking the question about whether it's okay to share vulnerable people's data as well. Um, and so it just it goes to, you know it goes to show that you do need uh, not just the the sort of regulation that works, but the wider the wider sort of ecosystem yeah. and conversation um, around that. So I think you know whatever whatever we sort of see. Um, in terms of the regulation, the need to uh, bring innovation hand in hand with, with each other, with trust, is is still pretty fundamental. Now, of course, every government has its mantras, and 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 one uh, um, uh, for this government is um, essentially leveling up. Uh, um, yeah. And I was reflecting on this. Open data has had quite a tradition in the past of being able to shine a light on disequities, on yeah. inequalities. I mean, famously, whether it was delivery of utilities to affected uh, parts of, of a country or a nation, or um, whether um, loans and finance was being equally and fairly shared. I mean, again, the ODI, when it was first started up, commissioned work in this area. Um, data has got to be a powerful agent for both showing what needs to be leveled up, but also helping do the levelling up. I guess we both agree on that. I think that the role that data could play in uh, in levelling up is, is hugely important. Um, and, you know, in particular, you look at sort of the role that the digital economy has played over the last several years. I think something like 6% of all jobs created in 2019 yeah. were, were in the tech space. Um, and we've already talked about the number of jobs that um, are sort of in data professions. Apparently, it's doubled between 2013 yeah. and 2020. Uh, and I reflect that neither my current job nor my previous job existed in 2013. Yeah. So, you know, I've seen that. I've seen that for myself. Itself, not a leveling up example per se, but um, you know the the opportunity it's creating is vast. But then the second point um, around enabling us to understand the scale of the opportunity, um, both to identify where there are where there are um, issues, um, to um, make sure that we are targeting people effectively. Uh, with policy and then uh, critically evaluating the policy actually and making sure that where government is investing its money it's getting a return on investment um, all of those things really matter but I do think we need to make sure as well um, that while we're looking at the role that data plays in policy that we are continually engaging people um, around the whole of the, the UK because levelling up has to be a whole of UK uh, story rather than rather than as in uh, Westminster and King's Cross sort of fig trying to figure that out for everyone else. Okay well we'll lay out to the audience and just a second, I just want to say one final point. I mean, I'm, we'll get a chance to wrap up at the end, I'm sure. But it just, just it's, uh, it's interesting that we always talk about the uh, the data tsunami. I was I was uh, uh, reading uh, the other day that um, in the pandemic, of course, we generated vast amounts of additional ephemeral data, and the, the thought is that only two percent of what's being generated is being stored persistently, and that you just can't feel that somewhere in that. <laughs> <laughs> data, there's probably quite important stuff that's being lost. So we often talk about a deluge, but there's also this extraordinary notion that there might be really quite important stuff that could matter that we haven't noticed yet. So anyway. The error bars are always there in our data, and it's really important that we're clear, and very different kinds of error bars, different kinds of uncertainties in the data, uh, in its currency, in the underlying models that are being applied, in the wider embedding. So. Um, the challenge is partly a communication one because people feel they need certainty and uh, um, it's quite hard to explain that science basically works by standing on the edge of error. I mean, it's always trying to, in danger of falsifying itself and people can argue about whether people really let go of bad hypotheses as rapidly as they should, 
But that whole issue around accepting that things cannot be precisely known in all contexts is so important. Yeah, and where are the um, where are the answers? Yeah, I mean, I think excellent answer. And I, I guess the question for CDEI is where does governance come into that? Um, and how do you help uh, people who are using data to sort of to work that through? And I, th and I do think it's quite important that people are aware of the risk around the uncertainty when they're when they're using data, and that none of this is uh, none of this is certain. But I think the thing that is encouraging is that whenever it comes to governance systems, uh, people it might not have been about data, but people have been dealing with risk and uncertainty in, in business and the public sector for a long time. We just need to be honest about where the risk is. Well, I think I think it's a, a hugely uh, it's a powerful and interesting technology, which is particularly well suited su suited to certain contexts where you really want to be assured of the provenance trails. You know, what is the history of origination? Um, so, contract uh, in particular seems to be a very interesting application. Other contexts of distributed uh, 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 computing worry me rather more. You know, the energetics of Bitcoin really does trouble me quite a lot, <laughs> but. Uh, no, I think that's a very promising area of development. Um, and, and developing the tools and assurance that go around that so you can aggregate, that you can uh, sensibly manage um, insights off of those uh, formats. I'm sure that'll be an increasingly important part. Um, sometimes distributed ledgers have been oversold in some contexts where they're not well suited, but I think contractual uh, um, and, 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 and various forms of, of, of evidence, documentation, use, repurposing is a very good one. Yeah, and just to say, I think an excellent, excellent question. And I think it's uh, easy to overlook the sort of wider uh, data-driven technologies beyond AI. AI is also one that sort of grabs people and, and takes a lot of the conversation. But I know that uh, the DLT has certainly riven, risen up the agenda from a, from a business perspective. And, and asking those governance questions will be really important. No, I think it's, a, it's actually a really, a really good question. And when you look at uh, regulation of, of AI, it is often on a more on a more sector basis. But I think that there are uh, there are factors with how you use AI and how you look at it that would be cross cutting um, as well. And I mean, that's that's one of the opportunities for the industry to develop. You know, would some be specialists in uh, in AI in an automotive context, and others be specialists in AI in a in a healthcare context? Um, I think that those are all questions that are very much sort of open ended. Um, at the moment, but I think the potential for developing that wider ecosystem and sharing knowledge between uh, between different systems is quite important. And, and often, where we see the most innovation is on those kind of edge cases between different uh, different sectors. So you're right, and these are all all questions that we're going to have to um, ask. And uh, we will be publishing our AI assurance roadmap. Uh, soon um, so I you know really hope that you'll engage with that and um, we can continue developing that it's a super good question though I mean I think again when we've looked at this in the ODI in the context of data assurance and al the underlying algorithms I mean you, you make a great point I mean in some sense these are generic issues um, so distribution shift for example is understood across uh, lots and lots of machine learning contexts so the thing you're trained on is differently represented in the in the training set than the deployed set but um, actually sometimes that sectoral nuances can be really, really important, super important, because you're just going to find lots and lots of particular sorts of susceptibility in biometric context that you might fi not find in, in, in others. So I think there's, these things have got to go, go line in line, and we shouldn't ex expect that AI regulation can be sector agnostic. Great question. Oh, wow, that's, it. that's a big one to big one to finish on. Um, well, I, well, I think one of the most important things actually does come back to the question around uh, data literacy and making sure that young people have access to the information that they need about how to use online spaces well uh, when they're in school. Um, and then I think that there are quite a lot of questions um, for industry about how you develop new uh, new innovations that actually help keep people uh, keep people safe and put more sort of uh, rings around people uh, when they're online that, that sort of keep them away from more worrying content. Yeah, I think. Look, I think there's quite a there's quite an onus on age appropriate design on the designers. I think we can't just live in a world where we kind of imagine that. Uh, the algorithms that are being, uh, you know, the uh, persuasive design algorithms are in some sense just, just a free-for-all. And we've got to kind of get a real sense of responsibility uh, into the whole life cycle. On the other hand, I think we can sometimes veer towards being, uh, um, not recognizing that children do develop quite interesting models of 
their own agency. And it's not the same all the way through a somebody younger than 16. I mean, this, this, this echoes developmental stages. So there's a load of really important work to do here that mirrors what we know about how these sensibilities develop and not just have a parental response, which is essentially sensorious, that there's actually something really important about the way you develop, co-develop with, 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 with the wider kind of context in which children exist, that, that sense of appropriacy, but it's a big, big topic. Yeah. Perhaps a closing thought, Felicity. I mean, uh, personal hopes for the future, uh, particularly as you're taking yeah. on this uh, new challenge, uh, just a month in, in post, I understand. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my big goal, and I hope it's not one that we can work with the ODI on, is that the UK can become an absolute world leader for the ethical development of uh, data and data-driven innovation. And, and certainly for the CDEI, um, I, I was sort of looking at um, my last job just before I left, I was looking at uh, how the UK could... Uh, how the UK could copy ARPA uh, and how we could try and do something that the US has been you know, doing for 60, 60 years. Um, and the reason we keep trying looking at that model is because it's really effective at driving innovation. But actually there are a lot of things that hold back innovation and trust and trustworthy ecosystems um, is one of them. Um, and I think where we, should, where we should be looking to be in the next 30 years or so uh, is the models like what the CDEI is doing and, of course, working with our friends throughout the ecosystem uh, is developing something that the rest of the world wants to copy and, and is sort of saying that is really the model for how we deliver trustworthy, data-driven innovation. So nothing's more. <laughs> okay, no, 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 quite right. Well, I mean, I think, I think when Tim and I set the ODI up... Um, conceivably long time ago now, it gets, where's the time gone? But when we did that, it was very much about building this trusted ecosystem. That was fundamentally about it. It was about trying to find the value in open data. And of course, we've extended our, our brief to realize that the entire data spectrum has to be attended to because what we choose to keep private, what we choose to share, what we keep generally open, these foundational elements really have got to, to work together. We just would like the, the broadest possible base to be open and shareable and in the public good. Uh, and, and as I look forward, and I think Tim, does, we, took, we had a conversation recently about you know, everything from climate to the pandemic to human migration, all the big issues, yeah. and indeed the regeneration of our economies uh, in all the sectors we care about. Um, data, a trusted data ecosystem is fundamentally essential. And we will face challenges of pollution, uh, 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 toxification of various sorts. We've talked about some of them, but I think organizations such as ours are, are fundamentally important for the, for the health and well-being of us individually and collectively. So, uh, yeah, you've got to be hopeful for the future. We'll uh, look we forward are. to working with you on it and indeed Absolutely. everyone in this room. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.